<laughs> the key sticks and it drives me nuts. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> ah. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. By the way, I have a big mouth, so. <laughs> you will hear today's sermon, if nothing else. <laughs> I should have warned you before I started. <laughs> Uh, when I when I fill in at Rock Springs, I always turn it off. So <laughs> anyway, uh, this morning, uh, let me uh, introduce myself a little bit. I grew up about a mile and a half from where Nedra grew up. Uh, we uh, her her folks lived out at the end of our road. Well, their road that came off our road, and uh, so I, I, I grew up there. Uh, I uh, then went into the military after, uh, after my years of milking cows, uh, came out of the military and was saved shortly thereafter. I was ordained to preach uh, 1983 and have, been, have had uh, several churches, but uh, now I work at the Baptist Student Union over at ms and I'm also a professor over there, and then I do interim around. So that's a little bit about my background and, and where I come from. I spent a lot of time in South Dakota. And if you've never been to South Dakota, don't go. But <laughs> I spent several, uh, several years up there. No, I shouldn't say that. It was a beautiful place in the summertime. It's not in the wintertime. Uh, but it's, uh, we adopted three kids from up there. And I'm sure that's why God had us uh, go up there was, was to do that. And my, my wife uh, regrets that she can't be here today. Uh, she does children's church at Rock Springs. And since it was her Sunday, uh, she had to, had to be there and, and do that. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. I've introduced myself. Let's talk about the Bible, okay? That's why we're here today. We're here to worship God. We're here to give Him all the glory. And it is my prayer this morning that everything said from this pulpit just brings glory to Him. Let, let's forget about all of us and let's just be worshiping Him this morning. This morning we're going to be talking about faith. Uh, the text comes from Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. And then if you'll turn over just a few more pages, you'll find James, the second chapter. And we'll go 14 through 26 as we'll be going through both of those as, as we go through this. Um, this morning, though, I'm going to begin with Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the convictions of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so, what that, is, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was, was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whomever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God, for this church. We thank you, O oh God, that it can be a light, a beacon to those in and around Licking, that, Lord, it would just serve your purpose and do your will. Lord, we'd ask this morning that you'd use your word to touch those that are out of the congregation. Lord, let every word said, every thought that is thought, and every deed that is done bring glory and honor to you. For you ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I noticed our pianist took a, uh, a, a, a thing I said in Sunday school. 
uh, after I, I believe it's Marvin, right? After Marvin brought up uh, the song in Sunday school, I said, "That's amazing." I'm going to begin my sermon with this song, and no, I'm not going to sing. Trust me. <laughs> you probably heard me singing there. It's not good. Amen. Good word back there. But it's the the words to that song were written by a man by the name of Horatio Stafford. And none of you know him, but it, his story is interesting. The song was written in 1871. And he, he owned a business in Chicago. And it was a very, very wealthy business. He had done quite well for himself. He had a wife and four children. And everything was just going marvelously well. But in 1871, the Chicago fire happened and wiped him out. In it, his youngest son died. So he had had tragedy enter into his life. His wife was so impacted by the death of their son that she wanted to go back to England to visit her parents for a time <clears throat> and, and, you know, just to grieve. And Horatio said, well, I've got to get my business re-going, but you go ahead, take the three girls, go back to England and uh, spend some time with your, with your parents. So she did. As she was going, the ship sank. Three of the daughters died. Only Anna, Horatio's wife, survived. Horatio soon got the news by, by telegraph and uh, he got on the first boat to go to England to join his wife. And while he was on that voyage, he penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like a sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. No matter what happens to us, we need to look upon that faith, that faith in God, to know that yes, all is well with my soul. It is only that faith and God's grace that can provide us peace. Licking had a tragedy this week. A horrific tragedy. My, my, my son, who's, uh, who's nine years old, was a, a pitcher on a Little League team this, this summer. And Tony was his catcher. And, and they, they, you know, they've, they've talked since a little bit since this happened. And both of them. They get it, but they don't. What you said this morning was perfect. They get it, but they don't. But, but I know my son, my nine-year-old is saved. He accepted Christ uh, late last summer. And even, even in this time where, where sorrows like sea billows roll, he came up to me and said, Daddy, God will take care of of everything. That's faith. That's what we're looking for this morning. And what I want to do today is talk about the importance of faith and what, may, and what, faith, what faith means and the three types of faith that exist out there. And as I, as I speak this morning, I want you to examine your own hearts to begin to understand what type of faith you might have. It's important. Hebrews 11, verse 6 right here, tells us that we must have faith to please God. You can't please God without faith. Old Enoch, he had faith. He never saw death. Abraham, and you know, it's that Hall of Champions in, in, in chapter 11 of Hebrews. But if you read later on, Abraham pleased God because he had faith. We have to have that faith. Ephesians, the second chapter in the eighth verse, tells us that for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is a free gift and you can't work for it. But let's, let's be very clear on that. But you have to have faith. You, God, God is offering you a free gift. Here it is. Here it is. Just take it. Just open it. But you have, to, you have to have the faith to take that grace. You, you have to open it. 
2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, For we walk with faith, not by sight. Faith is being able to believe even though everything around you is, is, is telling you different. And my goodness, you know, Nedra, when we were growing up back in the early days before they had fire, <laughs> did you ever think you'd see a world like this one? Neither did I. We had to build this new bathroom in our building. And I'm not going to go into the reasons why because there are young ones here and they don't need to hear it. But that we, the, the girls in our, the, the girls going to ms &T didn't want this teacher who used to be a boy to be walking in their bathroom. Did you ever think you'd live to see a day like this? But you know what? Even with all of that, I have faith in, in my Lord Jesus that, that it's, it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Romans 14.23 tells us that for whatever we do that's not done through faith is a sin. Now you ought to go read that, read that verse after, after a while. That means sometimes you might be doing what you think is right. What you think God might want. But we need to make sure the Holy Spirit wants us to be doing what we're doing. If it's not done through faith, it is sin. So we have to do it through what God want, wants us to do. Let's talk this morning about three types of faith. And we're going to talk about uh, these three types of faith because there's only one saving faith. The first type of faith that I want to talk about is the faith of the Pharisee. The Pharisees had a type of faith, didn't they? But, uh, we'll talk about the Pharisees in, in a moment. We're also going to talk about the faith of demons. Now that might surprise you. Demons have faith? Demons believe in God. They know. In fact, they don't believe they know God exists. They know God exists. But a faith of a demon is not going to save you. And then there's saving faith. And we're going to go through those types of faith this morning. And I hope that you can understand exactly what, what, what we're getting to. Let's turn over to James. And we're going to, we're going to talk about uh, James, the second chapter. Uh, but uh, down to verse uh, 14. Because I want to talk about the faith of the Pharisee. You see, the faith of a Pharisee was filled with, with words. The, the, the Pharisees had an intellectual faith. They believed that God exists. In fact, they, anybody ever wonder where the Pharisees got all those laws that, that they followed? You know, we, got, we have the Ten Commandments in Leviticus and Deuteronomy where we can read about that. <clears throat> but the Pharisees decided they needed to add to it. They wrote something called the Talmud. And in the Talmud, they list 200, or excuse me, 647 different laws that they had in the Old Testament. And then they wrote about them. For example, in the Talmud, there's six pages written on how you should keep the Sabbath. You know, you ought not do this. You can carry this, but you can't carry that. You know, all of this stuff. Uh, about how, those are just words. That isn't a heartfelt faith. You're giving you're giving God lip service, but but it's but it's only intellectual. That faith can't save. I want you to think about in the you, you, you all you know, if you've read the New Testament at all, you know about the man that was beaten and was laying in a ditch, right? Well, everybody knows Luke the, the the story of the Good Samaritan. And, and he was laying there and he had been beaten and robbed and he, he was just almost to the verge of death. And you know who walked by? A Pharisee. 
And you would think this man of God who had all this learning, I mean, he, he had gone to the best Jewish schools, the best Hebrew schools. He knew the law. He had, he had studied the, the Torah and the Talmud, and he knew all of that. And he saw the Pharisee lying there, and what did he do? He walked on by. True story, I once had a professor at Baylor, and uh, he didn't do this to our class, but he had done it to another class. It was a religious class. And he, uh, he told uh, his class that they were all, that they were going to be put in groups, and they had to come up with, with all of these ideas about the Good Samaritan, and they had to make a presentation to the class about the Good Samaritan. And, and so he did that, and he said uh, that it was due on such and such a date, and if you're late to class that day, I won't accept it. So you'd, you'd fail. Well, on the day that they were to give their, their, their report, their presentation, he had hired somebody from the theater department. He put them in old ragged clothes, he dirtied them up, and he set them on the front steps of the building that these students were walking into. And the, the, the theater department person was asking, would you, would you feel, I'm really hungry, would you, would you help me? And those students did what? Walked on in. Walked on in. But you know, let's not condemn those students too much. How many of us have walked on by we were in a hurry. We had somewhere to go. We had something to do. We walked on by. It warmed my heart a little bit this, this morning in Sunday school. They told the story of a homeless, John was his name, right? The story of a homeless man that asked to sit under your canopy in the rain. And instead of just leaving him under the canopy, you brought him in and fed him breakfast. That's faith. That's what, how we're to live our lives. Let, let's go to James, the second chapter, the 14th verse. This is important. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, as it, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say here this morning is the Pharisees had a type of faith, but they didn't have the works with it. If you're truly saved, they're interlinked. You can't work your way into heaven. Don't go out of here saying, well, you know that preacher that we brought in said we, you could work. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you are saved, you've got works. You, you want works. You feel a need to do work. And if you're not feeling that, then, then, then it's time to, to look inside and see, see what's going on. You see, the Pharisees... They, they, they had a faith. They had a faith in the words. They had a faith that if, as long as they followed those 640 some odd laws that they were going to be okay. But you know, that, that's not what God wants. The last person to pass by the person lying there in the ditch was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan back in that day was looked down upon. What they were, were uh, half Canaanite and half Jewish. It was a racial thing. They were, they were looked down upon. They, you know, you're, they're, they're unclean. They're not worthy. They're not as good as, as, as you and me. But you know, when that Samaritan passed by and saw the man lying there, he picked him up. He cleaned him up. He took him to an inn and gave the innkeeper enough money so that the man could heal in that end and not be, you know, not be just out on the street. That's, that's what God is, is asking. God is not asking for the faith of the Pharisee. He doesn't want you walking on by. 
He just doesn't. He wants you to have the faith of the Samaritan. Um, if you ever noticed when Jesus was out doing miracles, read, read the first six chapters of Mark. I love Mark. Mark just gets right to the point. He, you know, he's a journalist. He tells the who, what, when, why, and where. He's not like Paul that puts in all this other stuff that you got to kind of work through. Mark tells it like it is. Mark talks about miracle after miracle. You know, the people that, that lowered the guy in so Jesus could heal him. The, you know, just, you know, the woman with the blood issue. All of these different miracles that, that Jesus performed. But you know, Mark also records something else. <clears throat> these Pharisees would follow Jesus around. And every time he did a miracle, he healed a man. And he healed him on a Sunday. The Pharisees' hearts were so hard that they weren't thankful about the man being healed. They were mad because he did it on a Sunday. Now there's something wrong with that type of faith. Something wrong. And, and what, what the Bible is telling us, or what Mark is telling us through those first six or eight chapters is make sure our faith is in the, in the right area. I always love the, the story of the woman who had the blood issue. She, she didn't come up to talk to Jesus. She didn't ask that she could be healed. What did she do? reached up and touched his garment. And actually, the, 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 at the time, the, the men would wear these tassels on, the, on their garment. She, the, the Bible indicates it's just a tassel. She just reached up and touched it. And she was healed. Why was she healed? Faith. Faith. She had faith that Jesus could heal her. And that's, that's, what, that's not the faith of the Pharisee. Don't, 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 don't have that faith of the Pharisee. Don't be so, you know, locked in the way you view the world that, you know, that, that you have all these words, but you don't, you, you don't have the faith. That, that's something that, that we re really need to think about. The second, this is the first type of faith, the faith of the Pharisee is, is intellectual. Let's talk about the second type of faith. James 2, 18 and 19. Let's go down and read it. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even though demons believe and shudder. The demons have a faith. The demons believe. The demons believe in God. In fact, in Mark 3.11, we, we see that, we, we see that uh, demons even believe in the deity of, deity of, deity of Christ. <clears throat> in fact, the demons in Mark 3.11 say, you are the Son of God. They, they believed in They knew. They knew. Demons also believe in a place of condemnation. We can look at Luke 8, and verse 31, and we can see where they believe in hell. They're there. Why wouldn't they believe? They also believe that Jesus will judge. Matthew 8, 28 and 29. They have all that belief. The demons have both an emotional and an intellectual faith. Why do I say they have an emotional faith? Because it says they shuddered, they trembled. So how it's translated in, in some of your Bibles. They know that God exists and they fear Him. They absolutely fear Him. Now, what am I getting at with this? There are too many people in today's church, and I'm going to step on some toes here, and I'm sorry if I do, that have this charismatic faith that's all emotional. Right. We need to make sure we're just not being carried away. We're just not follow, following along. Can I pick on Baptists a little bit? Is that alright? <laughs> Baptists, back when I was a kid, had a real bad uh, practice of trying to get every little six and seven year old to walk this aisle so you could dunk them. 
They did. They tried to get them to do that. Then they could add, pad the numbers, pad the numbers. We have to be careful that we're not just having an emotional reaction. There is nothing wrong with a lot of today's Christian music. Not going to say that. Our church sings mostly contemporary music. But I will say that, not your, I don't know what church, but our church does. But I will say this, when you're getting carried away by the music and not by the Holy Spirit behind the music, then, you, then you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Don't let emotionalism be your guide. My goodness, I'm happy today. What am I apt to be tomorrow? You know, I, true story. I was going to take a whole bunch of calves to the sale barn over in Salem tomorrow. <laughs> I had planned this all out for a month. I, you know, and I got them ready, and I'd, I'd even built a pen and got them. And Mark calls me on, on one day this week. He says, why are you doing all that? I said, I'm taking the calves to the sale. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> They're not going to have a sale on Monday. I'm not real happy about that. <laughs> i got to buy another week's worth of food, plus take a day off work, because I have tomorrow off, and I won't have next Monday off. I'm not real happy about Salem right now. But you know what? I can't let that emotion yeah. dictate my faith. Right. You just can't. I mean, here's the other thing I want to talk about. We ha and, and if I step it on toes again, I'm sorry. We have too many marriages crumbling because they're basing everything on emotion. Mm, you're right. On emotion. You know what? I had a student. I teach statistics and probability and experimental design. All that stuff none of you want to do. But I had a student in this class and she was doing this, re and she was also in biology and neuroscience. So she was doing a study on love. And what she found out was when you first have that chemical reaction where you think you love somebody, you got all these different chemicals firing off in your head. You know, endomorphines and, and adrenaline and, and dopamine and all of this stuff. It's like cocaine, actually, but that's another story. <laughs> so you got all this flying around. You know what happens about eight, after 18 months? <laughs> all of those chemicals quit firing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a little more commitment and a lot fewer relationships based on emotion. Let's look for commitment. Uh, when we were in South Dakota, until uh, they got a Baptist church in around where we were, we went oftentimes to a Mennonite church. It was New Order Mennonite, not Old Order. But that you, I, I won't go into. They, 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 they dress like you and I do. They drove cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they were still Mennonite. And we went to their church for a while simply because that was the only church within. If you've never been to South Dakota, you don't know. There, nobody lives up there. The whole state has 600,000 people in it. Think about that for a while. Uh, so, but anyway, we went to this church for a while. And I think God sent me there just for this reason, was to meet this one man. He had married in his 20s. His, he and his wife had three or four children. But his wife got early onset Alzheimer's. And I don't know if you know what that is or not, but it's Alzheimer's beginning late 40s, early 50s. By the time she was 51 or 52, she didn't even know who this guy was. Didn't know him. Didn't know her own kids. This guy, and the world would have said, you know, this is justified. He ought to leave. He ought to go out and find new happiness. He ought to, you know, just, just, you know, put her in a home and not. This guy, still to this day, by the way, takes care of her every single day. And when he's not at work, he hires someone to come in take care of her every single now is he happy now, let's be real truthful is this a happy story no 
He doesn't, you know, it's no fun dealing with someone who doesn't even know you every morning when you wake up. Who needs help even going to the bathroom. But he does it every single day because he's committed. That's the type of faith we need. We need to be committed to our Lord Jesus Christ. Even when things go bad. Even when the sale barn closes on Monday when it's not supposed to. <laughs> we need to stay committed. I pray a lot with Jimmy. I don't know if he, he talks about... You. We go to the back room of town and country. We pray all the time. I have never seen a man more committed to the Lord Jesus Christ than Jimmy Miller. Even though he has all kinds of difficulty. He stayed strong in that faith. We're going to have all kinds of difficulty. You're going to have a kid that drives you crazy. Somebody in here adopted four. One of them's going to drive you crazy. Maybe all four of them. If you got natural kids, you ain't you aren't any better. They're going to drive you crazy too. They're, and sometimes they're going to do wrong things, and sometimes you're going to be upset. We keep walking. We remain committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. That commitment is what's important. Remember, demons have knowledge. Demons are emotionally invested. They are. It takes more than that. Let's talk about saving faith. Saving faith is the mind, the emotion, the will, everything that we are. Let me, let me tell you something. The Bible tells us in Romans that we must die to whom and accept whom as our Lord and Savior. We have to die to self. We have to put all of that behind us. Now, and that's hard to do. Because we're born in this old natural world and we have natural wants and desires. We do. We, we want stuff. We feel like we may even need stuff. But we need to understand that it's the Lord that we need to die to. Um, Paul calls himself a bondservant of Christ. Do you understand what that means? That means a total slave. Back in, in Roman times, if you were a bond servant, you were the lowest. You could be killed and nobody cared. You could be used horrifically and nobody cared. You were nothing but a slave. We are a slave to our Lord Jesus Christ and we need to accept that. This isn't a democracy, ladies and gentlemen. To, I mean, we, we've grown up in an era, thank the Lord for it, where we have freedom and we have democracy and we can vote on who... But the kingdom of God is not a democracy. There is one king, he rules, we need to be servants to him. Amen. And everything else that gets in the way of that, we need to push aside. Becoming a faithful servant of Jesus Christ is more than just an emotional response. It's doing things sometimes when you don't want to do them. This summer, uh, our church went to Worland, Wyoming to do a, a mission. We did backyard Bible clubs. And, and if you don't know anything about Worland, most of you haven't been there, but it's a, it's a, it's a town of about six or 8,000 sitting at the basin of the, of the Rocky Mountains. A lot of darkness there. Uh, a lot of uh, American Indians that aren't, aren't churched, a lot of Mormons that have a perverted belief, and then a lot of folks who just don't have any belief at all. And you know, it's hard, and I didn't want to go. I'm going to be really honest. I did not want to go to Worland, Wyoming. I mean, I was telling God, you know, I've got so much to do at work, and I've got so much to do at home, and I've got this, and I, and it's got, you know, I don't want to take the old truck and put that, that many more miles off. And I kept making all these excuses. But in the end, the Lord told me, you will go. You will go. I have appointed you to. So we went. Took the whole family. 
While we were there, my middle son led someone to Jesus Christ. It wasn't about me going. <laughs> It, wasn't, it was not about me other than being committed. God wanted to use who? That boy. He wanted to use that boy. And he couldn't get there without me driving. Now sometimes you... And, and this is an important part of faith. Sometimes it's not about being the preacher or the Sunday school teacher. Sometimes it's making sure the floor is clean. Sometimes it's making sure the bathroom's clean. Sometimes it's shaking someone's hand when they walk through the door. That's faithful Christianity. That's having faith. I'm going to say this, and I believe James the second chapter and Hebrews 11 back me up. If you say you have faith and you don't have any works, re-examine yourself. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Look at Hebrews 11. It talks about the faith of Abraham. Abraham led his boy. And by the way, that boy wasn't a small child back then. I don't know how long I'm supposed to go. So if it's time for me to shut up, tell me. If, if he led his, that, that small boy Abraham up. Uh, well, we thought, uh, people think it's a small boy. He wasn't. He was, he was up 17, 18, 19 years old. He had to make a choice to follow his dad. To go up to that altar, laid him an altar, took a knife, because he had faith, I honestly believe that God would provide. And what did God do? He provided. Sometimes we don't know where our next payment for rent's going to come from. Sometimes we don't know. Our car just broke down. We don't know how we're going to get it fixed. Sometimes we just <coughs> have all kinds of troubles. We have to have the faith, have the commitment. Another person in that hall of champions in Hebrews 11 is a woman by the name of Rahab. Let's talk about Rahab just a minute. Number one, she was a Canaanite. Number two, she was a prostitute. Number three, somehow she found the Lord and, the, and she had faith. And what did the Lord do? Pulled her out along with her and her family. And did you know she is in the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus? A, a Canaanite prostitute. Think about that. The Lord will use you. No, uh, too many, I, I, when I witness to people sometimes, they'll say things, well, you don't know everything that I've done. You don't know how bad I've been. You don't know this. You don't know that. I promise you, Rahab and Paul, formerly known as Saul, has done worse. I promise you. The Lord will save us as long as we have faith. Abel believed God. He brought the right sacrifice. Not because it was an animal. Now, if you read Leviticus, they had grain sacrifices. Cain didn't have the right attitude. Therefore, Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. <clears throat> Noah. And I'll end here. I want you to think about Noah a minute. Noah was building a boat. Anybody ever been to Israel? Or Canaan and that. Tell me what the land's like there. How dry is it? It is a desert, isn't it? Or basically desert. Noah was building a boat out in the middle of the desert. Don't you know people were laughing at him? So Noah, what are you doing? <clears throat> By the way, did God give him all the money? Or did, you know, God did, but I mean, th he had to take the money God had given him and do what with it? Spend it on building this boat. Which says something else about faith. People were laughing at him, people were mocking him. I, I am sure that even, even Noah's wife and kids sometimes looked at him just a little bit. But in the end, what happened? Noah had faith. Noah had commitment. All of Noah's mind, his emotion, and his will 
were wrapped up in his faith and he acted. James chapter 2 says us, tells us that faith without works is dead. If you have faith, you will have works. That's how it's linked. It's not works alone. It's not faith without works. You've got, if you have the faith, you will have the works. And, and people, Baptists have a, such a hard time believing that. They'll go, well, once saved, always saved. I don't have to do... Folks, if that's your belief, and I'm a believer in once saved, always saved, but if you believe that, you know, you're all right because when you were seven years old, you walked this aisle and you haven't done anything since, you need to re-examine. You need to think about what you're doing. That's, that's an important part of this. I want to thank you so much for inviting me here today. I was truly an honor and a pleasure to bring you this message. But this morning, if you're questioning your faith, if you don't know, then you need to come and take care of it. You need to leave it at the altar. You need to leave it at the feet of Jesus. He alone can say. Lots of people say they can say. They can't. Muhammad, Buddha, the 754 Hindu gods. In fact, they have more than that. Whatever. They all say they can save, but there is only one Savior. Right. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you don't know Him today, come. Find Him. We're going to have a song and uh, an invitation and it's our pianist and it's all the way to God. If we all stand... This, this invitation is, is for anyone that uh, needs Christ. Please, come.